Oh, that was kind of a weird start. Loaded the channel and the recorded was synced up with the same um, time indicator as the uh, scene in Streamlabs, even though they were different. Thought for a second I was streaming before I pushed the button. Hey, little dude. <laughs> a little bit. It's a little bit different. Uh, I marked it uh, mature because I can't promise that we won't get into discussions that are not appropriate for little ears, Vela. So be, do be warned. You may need to, uh, I don't know, call earmuffs or something. Sorry, I haven't been on in a few days. I've uh, been struggling. For those of you who read the about, um, I am a disabled veteran. I served in my country's military, and uh, some bad things happened while I did. And this coming weekend is the anniversary of it. And so a lot of that stuff's kind of on my mind at the moment little near to the surface. And you're doing better than some years, but I am struggling a bit with it. So. And it isn't. Thanks, Sparky. What happened to me wasn't good or, I don't know. Some people have a, hey Gecko. Some people have this mistaken notion that, you know, something happens to you in the military. It's, I don't know. Anyway, it was nothing good. And it left wounds I've never healed from. So, not physical ones. Nothing you can, nothing you can see. But it's something I'm having a hard time with right now. So that's why I didn't stream over the weekend, and I'm sorry. Anyway, speaking of timeception, Villa. I was thinking long and hard about what to uh, pick up in this time slot after we finished the Clue of the Twisted Candle. and I didn't really want to read Sherlock Holmes. And pretty much all the remaining Agatha Christie ones are still uh, not in the public domain. And uh, so I decided to do something a little different. At first I thought... I'd read some uh, Alexandre Dumas, because he's a great author, really enjoy him. If you're not familiar, uh, he's the one who wrote the uh, Three Musketeer novels and The Count of Monte Cristo, and the even better sequel to The Count of Monte Cristo, Edmund Dantes. Hey, J. Math. By the way, J. Math, you, uh, you won the giveaway. Congratulations. So uh, get with me and we'll figure out your prize. But you had four points. Hey, Panda. I don't know what that's supposed to be, Panda. All I see is a box. Or a stick, maybe? Oh, I don't know. Anyway. Wasn't really up for... Monte Cristo, it's a little intense at the moment. Bread, maybe bread. So, decided we'd go a little meta and read 
the Arabian Nights, which is stories told by a storyteller attempting to escape a terrible fate. So it's me, a storyteller, reading to distract, distract myself and escape from the demons inside by reading the story of someone trying to escape her own demons by telling stories. So, a little bit better, a little bit Inception there. I don't know if any of you have read The Arabian Nights before, but it's where stories like uh, Sinbad and um, Alibaba and the Forty Thieves and Aladdin and the Lamp uh, came from. And so those are all kind of contained within this one. But they're all part of like a larger narrative uh, framing device. So that's what we're gonna. That's what we're gonna read. I'm gonna grab the naked one. Cover up the book cover and the title. We might have some new patterns on the Sisyphus too. I uh, just ran an update, so there might be some new ones for you. Yeah, we'll pick up the Arabian Nights. I'm not doing better, J Math. I appreciate the thoughts, but nope not something that's going to get better and I may talk about it here and there I'm still not sure how much I'm comfortable sharing on stream that's part of why I uh, didn't stream over the weekend is um, frankly when the stuff's near the surface I sometimes overshare and talk about it more than I'm really ready for and I'm not sure if I'm comfortable doing that on stream or not. I don't know. So. But. First story. Scheherazade. The Chronicles of the Sasanians. Ancient kings of Persia. Tell us that there was formerly a king of that powerful family who was regarded as the most excellent prince of his time. He was as much beloved by his subjects for his wisdom and prudence as he was dreaded by his neighbors on account of his valor and well-disciplined troops. He had two sons, the elder, Shariar, the worthy heir of his father, and endowed with all his virtues, and the younger, Shazanon, a prince of equal merit. After a long and glorious reign, this king died, and Shariar mounted the throne, Shazanon, being excluded from all share in the government by the laws of the empire, was so far from envying the happiness of his brother that he made it his whole business to please him, and in this succeeded without much difficulty. Shariar, who had naturally a great affection for the prince, his brother, gave him the kingdom of greater Tartary. Shazanon went immediately and took possession of it, and fixed the seat of his government at Samarkand, the metropolis of the country. After they had been separated ten years, Shariar, being very desirous of seeing his brother, resolved to send his vizier to invite him to his court. When he came near to the city, Shazanon was informed of his approach, and went to meet him, attended by the principal lords of his court, who, to show the greater honor to the sultan's minister, appeared in magnificent apparel. The king of Tartary rece received the ambassador with the greatest demonstrations of joy and immediately asked him concerning the welfare of the sultan, his brother. The vizier, having acquainted him that he was in health, informed him of the purpose of his embassy. Shazanon was very much affected and answered, Sage vizier, the sultan, my brother, does me too much honor. 
Nothing could be more agreeable to me, for I as ardently long to see him as he does to see me. My kingdom is at peace, and I want no more than ten days to get myself ready to return with you. There is, therefore, no necessity for your entering the city for so short a period. I pray you to pitch your tents here, and I will order everything necessary to be provided for yourself and your attendants. The vizier readily complied, and Shah Zanon, having made his preparations, at the end of ten days took leave of the queen, his wife, and went out of town in the evening with his revenue, retinue. He pitched his royal pavilion near the vizier's tent, and conversed with him till midnight. Wishing once more to see the queen, whom he ardently loved, he returned alone to his palace, when, to his inexpressible grief, he found her trafficking with his enemies for his betrayal. Before the conspirators were aware of his presence, the king, urged by his just resentment, drew his scimitar and slew them, and then pitched their bodies into the fosse which surrounded the palace. Having thus avenged himself, he returned to his pavilion, without saying one word of what had happened, gave orders that the tents should be struck, and before day began his march with kettle drums and other instruments of music that filled everyone with joy, excepting the king. He was so much afflicted by the disloyalty of his wife that he was seized with extreme melancholy, which preyed upon his spirits during the whole of his journey. When he drew near the capital of Persia, the Sultan Shariar and all his court came out to meet him. The princes were overjoyed to see one another, and having alighted after mutual embraces and other marks of affection and respect, remounted and entered the city amidst the acclamations of the people. The Sultan conducted his brother to the palace provided for him, which had a communication with his own by a garden. It was so much the more magnificent because it was set apart as a banqueting house for public entertainments and other diversions of the court. Shariar immediately left the king of Tartary, that he might give him time to bathe and to change his apparel. As soon as his guest had completed his toilet, he returned to him again, and they sat down together on a sofa or alcove, and the two princes entertained one another suitably to their friendship and their long separation. The time of supper being come, they ate together, after which they renewed their conversation, till Shariar, perceiving that it was very late, left his brother to repose. The unfortunate Shazanon retired to bed. Although the conversation of his brother had suspended his grief for some time, it now returned again with increased violence. Far into the night, instead of taking his necessary rest, he tormented himself with the bitterest reflections. All the circumstances of his wife's treachery presented themselves afresh to his imagination, in so lively a manner that he was like one distracted. Not being able to sleep, he arose and abandoned himself to the afflicting thoughts, which made such an impression upon his countenance that it was impossible for the sultan not to observe. Shariar, distressed by the melancholy of his brother, endeavored to divert him every day by new objects of pleasure and the most splendid entertainments. But these, instead of affording him ease, only increased his sorrow. Okay, too hot. <coughs> Sorry, I just poured the tea and it's still too hot. I think I burned the end of my tongue a little bit. One day, Shariar, having appointed a great hunting match, about two days' journey from his capital, in a place that abounded with deer. Too late, J-Math. But... At least I didn't uh, dump it on my arm again. Shazanon besought him to excuse his attendance, for his health would not allow him to bear him company. The sultan, unwilling to put any constraint upon him, left him at his liberty and went a-hunting with his nobles. The king of Tartary, being thus left alone, shut himself up in his apartment and sat down at a window that looked into the garden. In this place, where he could see and not be seen, 
He soon became a witness of a circumstance which attracted the whole of his attention. A secret gate of the Sultan's palace suddenly opened, and there came out of it several persons, in the midst of whom walked the Sultana, who was easily distinguished from the rest by her majestic air. This princess, thinking that the king of Tartary was gone a-hunting with his brother the Sultan, came with her retinue near the windows of his apartment, and the prince heard her hold treasonable conversation with some of her companions. The baseness of his brother's wife filled the king of Tartary with a multitude of reflections. How little reason had I, said he, to think that none was so unfortunate as myself. It is surely the unavoidable fate of all in power and high position to have their honor and estate conspired against. Such being the case, what a fool am I to kill myself with grief. I am resolved that the remembrance of a misfortune so common shall never more disturb my peace. From that moment he forbore afflicting himself. He called for his supper, ate with a better appetite than he had done since his leaving Samarkand, and listening with some degree of pleasure to the concert of vocal and instrumental music that was appointed to entertain him while at table. He continued after this to be very cheerful, and when he was informed that the Sultan was returning, went to meet him and paid him his compliments with great gaiety. Shariar, who expected to have found his brother in the same state as he had left him, was overjoyed to see him so cheerful. Dear brother, said he, I return thanks to heaven for the happy change it has wrought in you during my absence. Pray, do me the favor to tell me why you were so melancholy, and wherefore you are no longer so. The king of Tartary continued for some time as if he had been meditating and contriving what he should answer, but at last replied, You are my sultan and master, but excuse me, I beseech you, from answering your question. No, dear brother, said the sultan, you must answer me. I will take no denial. Shah Zanon, not being able to withstand these pressing entreaties, replied, Well then, brother, I will satisfy you since you command me. And having told him the story of the Queen of Samarkand's treachery, this, said he, was the cause of my grief. Judge whether I had not sufficient reason for my depression. Oh, my brother, said the Sultan, what a horrible event you do, do you tell me. I commend you for punishing the traitors to your state and person. None can blame you for what you have done. It was just, and for my part, had the case been mine, I should scarcely have been so moderate. I now cease to wonder at your melancholy. The cause was too afflicting and too mortifying not to overwhelm you. Oh, heaven, what a strange adventure. But I must bless God who has comforted you. And since I doubt not, but your consolation is well grounded, be so good as to inform me what it is and conceal nothing from me. Shah Zanon was not so easily prevailed upon in this point as he had been in the other, on his brother's account. But being obliged to yield to his pressing insistence, he related to his brother the conversation he had overheard. And having heard these things, he continued, I believed all women to be naturally treacherous. Being of this opinion, it seemed to me to be in men an unaccountable weakness to place any confidence in their fidelity. This reflection brought on so many others, and, in short, I thought the best thing I could do was to make myself easy on my own account, and warn you to anticipate the Sultana and her designs upon you. Yeah, probably not. Although, honestly, I think limiting it to a single gender is a little short-sighted. I think, unfortunately, that the uh, nature of treachery in the species is not bound by any particular gender. A lot of shittiness in the world without uh, it being ascribed to one gender or the other. Well, one gender or any gender, I should say. On hearing the dreadful tidings which his brother imparted to him, the sultan fell into an incontrollable rage, 
and instantly gave instructions for the execution of the Sultana and her fellow conspirators. After this rigorous measure, being persuaded that no woman was to be trusted, he resolved, in order to prevent the disloyalty of such as he should afterward marry, to wed once every day and have her strangled next morning. It's a healthy response there. Having imposed this cruel law upon himself, he swore that he would put it in force immediately after the departure of the king of Tartary, who shortly took leave of him, and being laden with magnificent presents, set forward on his journey. Shah Zanon having departed, Shariar informed his grand vizier of his vow, and ordered him to provide him with a new wife every day. Whatever reluctance the vizier might feel to put such orders in execution, as he owed blind obedience to the sultan his master, he was forced to submit, and thus every day was a maid married and a wife murdered. The rumor of this unparalleled barbarity occasioned a general consternation in the city, where there was nothing but crying and lamentation. Here, a father in tears, and inconsolable for the loss of his daughter, and there, tender mothers dreading lest their daughters should share the same fate, filling the air with cries of distress and apprehension, so that, instead of the commendations and blessings which the sultan had hitherto received from his subjects, their mouths were now filled with imprecations. Justifiably so. The Grand Vizier, who as has already been observed, was the unwilling executioner of this horrid course of injustice, had two daughters, the elder, called Scheherazad, and the younger, Dinarzad. The latter was highly accomplished, but the former possessed courage, wit, and penetration infinitely above her sex. She had read much and had so admirable a memory that she never forgot anything she had read. She had successfully applied herself to philosophy, medicine, history, and the liberal arts, and her poetry excelled the compositions of the best writers of her time. Besides this, she was a perfect beauty, and all her accomplishments were crowned by surpassing virtue. The vizier passionately loved this daughter, so worthy of his affection. One day, as they were conversing together, she said to him, Father, I have one favor to beg of you, and most humbly pray you to grant it. I will not refuse, answered he, provided it be just and reasonable. For the justice of it, she resumed she, there can be no question, and you may judge of this by the motive which obliges me to make the request. I wish to stop that barbarity which the sultan exercises upon the families of this city. I would dispel those painful apprehensions which so many mothers feel of losing their daughters in such a fatal manner. Your design, daughter, replied the vizier, is very commendable, but the evil you would remedy seems to me incurable. How do you propose to effect your purpose? Father, said Shazerazad, since by your means the sultan makes every day a new marriage, I conjure you, by the tender affection you bear me, to procure me the honor of his hand. The vizier could not hear this without horror. O oh, heaven, he replied in a passion, have you lost your senses, daughter, that you make such a dangerous request? You know the sultan's vow. Would you then have me propose you to him? Consider well to what your indiscreet zeal will expose you. Yes, dear father, replied the virtuous daughter, I know the risk I run, but that does not alarm me. If I perish, my death will be glorious, and if I succeed, I shall do my country an important service. No, no, said the vizier, whatever you may offer to induce me to let you throw yourself into such imminent danger, do not imagine that I will ever consent. When the sultan shall command me to strike my poniard into your heart, alas, I must obey. And what an employment will that be for a father? Ah, if you do not dread death, at least cherish some fears of afflicting me with the mortal grief of imbruing my hands in your blood. Once more, father, replied Scheherazad, grant me the favor I solicit. Your stubbornness, resumed the vizier, will rouse my anger. 
why will you run headlong to your ruin? They who do not foresee the end of a dangerous enterprise can never conduct it to a happy issue. Father, replied Scheherazade, I wish you would not take it so ill that I persist in my opinion. Besides, pardon me for declaring that your opposition is vain, for if your paternal affection should hinder you from granting my request, I will go and offer myself to the sultan. In short, the father, being overcome by the resolution of his daughter, yielded to her importunity, and though he was much grieved that he could not divert her from so fatal a resolution, he went instantly to acquaint the sultan that next night he would bring him Scheherazade. The sultan was much surprised at the sacrifice which the grand vizier proposed to make. How could you, said he, resolve to bring me your own daughter? Sire, answered the vizier, it is her own offer. The sad destiny that awaits her could not intimidate her. She prefers the honor of being your majesty's wife for one night to her life. But do not act under a mistake, vizier, said the sultan. Tomorrow, when I place Scheherazade in your hands, I expect you will put her to death. And if you fail, I swear that your own life shall answer. Sire, rejoined the vizier, though I am her father, I will answer for the fidelity of my hand to obey your order. To hell with that. You want to lay hands on my kid like that? We're going to have an issue. Uh, when the Grand Vizier returned to Scheherazade, she thanked her father for having obliged her, and perceiving that he was overwhelmed with grief, told him that she hoped he would never repent of having married her to the Sultan, and that on the contrary, he should have reason to rejoice at his compliance all his days. Her business now was to adorn herself to appear before the Sultan, but before she went, she took her city, sister Dinazard apart and said to her, My dear sister, I have need of your assistance in a matter of great importance, and must pray you not to deny it me. My father is going to conduct me to the sultan. Do not let this alarm you, but hear me with patience. As soon as I am in his presence, I will pray him to allow you to come early on the morrow, that I may enjoy your company for an hour or two ere I bid you farewell and go to my death. If I obtain that favor, as I hope to do, remember, shortly after your arrival, to address me in these or some such words. My sister, I pray you that ere I leave you, which must be very shortly, you will relate to me one of those entertaining stories of which you have recounted so many. I will immediately tell you one, and I hope by this means to deliver the city from the consternation it is under at present. Dinarzad answered that she would, with pleasure, act as she required her. The Grand Vizier conducted Scheherazade to the palace, and retired, after having introduced her into the Sultan's apartment. As soon as the Sultan was left alone with her, he ordered her to uncover her face. He found her so beautiful that he was perfectly charmed, but, perceiving her to be in tears, demanded the reason. Sire, answered Scheherazade, I have a sister who loves me tenderly, and I could wish that she might be allowed to come early on the morrow to this chamber, that I might see her, and once more bid her adieu. Will you be pleased to allow me the consolation of giving her this last testimony of my affection? Shariar having consented, Dinarzad came an hour before dawn on the next day, and failed not to do as her sister had ordered. My dear sister, cried she, ere I leave you, which will be very shortly, I pray you to tell me one of those pleasant stories you have read. Alas, this will be the last time I shall enjoy that pleasure. Scheherazade, instead of answering her sister, addressed herself to the sultan. Sire, will your majesty be pleased to allow me to afford my sister this satisfaction? With all my heart, replied the sultan. Scheherazade then bade her sister attend, and afterward, addressing herself to Shariar, proceeded as follows. The Merchant and the Genie there was formerly a merchant who possessed much property and lands, goods, and money. 
One day, being under the necessity of going a long journey on an affair of importance, he took horse and carried with him a wallet containing biscuits and dates, because he had a great desert to pass over, where he could procure no sort of provisions. He arrived without any accident at the end of his journey, and having dispatched his affairs, took horse again in order to return home. The fourth day of his journey, he was so much incommoded by the heat of the sun that he turned out of the road to refresh himself under some trees, where he found a fountain of clear water. Having alighted, he tied his horse to a branch, and sitting down by the fountain, took some biscuits and dates out of his wallet. As he ate his dates, he threw the stones carelessly in different directions. When he had finished his repast, being a good Mussulman, he washed his hands, face, and feet, and said his prayers. Before he had finished, and while he was yet on his knees, he saw a genie of monstrous bulk advancing toward him with great fury, whirling a scimitar in his hand. The genie spoke to him in a terrible voice, Rise, that I may kill thee with the scimitar, as thou hast killed my son, and accompanied these words with a frightful roar. The merchant, being as much alarmed by the hideous shape of the monster as by his threats, answered him, trembling, Alas, how could I kill your son? I never knew, never saw him. Did you not, when you came hither, demanded the genie, take dates out of your wallet, and as you ate them, throw the stones about in different directions? I did all that you say, answered the merchant. I cannot deny it. <laughs> when thou wert throwing the stones about, resumed the genie, my son was passing by, and thou didst throw one into his eye, which killed him. Therefore I must kill thee. Ah, my lord, pardon me, cried the merchant. No pardon, exclaimed the genie, no mercy. Is it not just to kill him that has killed another? I agree it is, replied the merchant, but certainly I never killed your son, and if I have, it was unknown to me, and I did it innocently. I beg you, therefore, to pardon me, and suffer me to live. No, no, returned the genie, persisting in his resolution. I must kill thee, since thou hast killed my son. Then, taking the merchant by the arm, he threw him with his face on the ground, and lifted up his scimitar to cut off his head. As soon as she had spoken these words, perceiving it was day, and knowing that the sultan rose early in the morning to say his prayers and hold his counsel, Scheherazade discontinued her story. Dear sister, said Dinarzad, what a wonderful story is this. The remainder of it, replied Scheherazade, is more surprising, as you will allow, if the sultan will but permit me to live this day and allow me to proceed with the relation on the morrow. Shariar, who had listened to Scheherazade with much interest, resolved not to put her to death that day, but decided to execute her when she had finished the story. He arose, went to his prayers, and then attended his counsel. The power of the cliffhanger to the rescue. During this time, the Grand Vizier was in the utmost distress. Instead of sleeping, he spent the night bewailing the lot of his daughter of whom he believed he should himself shortly be the executioner. As, with this melancholy prospect before him, he dreaded to meet the sultan, he was agreeably surprised when he found the prince entered the council chamber without giving him the fatal orders he expected. The sultan, according to his custom, spent the day in regulating his affairs, and, when the night had closed in, retired with Scheherazade. The next morning before day, the sultan, without waiting for Scheherazade to ask his permission, bade her proceed with the story of the genie and the merchant, upon which Scheherazade continued her relation as follows. When the merchant saw that the genie was going to cut off his head, he cried to him, For heaven's sake, hold your hand. Allow me one word. Have the goodness to grant me a respite of one year, to bid my wife and children adieu, and to divide my estate among them. But I promise you that this day, twelve months, I will return under these trees to put myself into your hands. Do you take heaven to be witness to this promise, said the genie? I do, answered the merchant, and you may rely on my oath. Thereupon the genie left him near the fountain, 
and disappeared. When the merchant, on reaching home, related what had passed between him and the genie, his wife uttered the most piteous cries, beat her face and tore her hair. The children, all in tears, made the house resound with their groans. And the father, not being able to resist the impulse of nature, mingled his tears with theirs. <laughs> At last the year expired and he was obliged to depart. He put his burial clothes in his wallet, but when he came to bid his wife and children adieu, their grief surpassed description. Affected beyond measure by the parting with his dear ones, the merchant journeyed to the place where he had promised to meet the genie. Seating himself down by the fountain, he awaited the coming of the genie with all the sorrow imaginable. While he languished under this painful expectation, an old man leading a hind appeared and drew near him. After they had saluted one another, the old man inquired of him why he was in that desert place. The merchant related his adventures to the old man's astonishment. When he had done, the old man exclaimed, This is the most surprising thing in the world, and you are bound by the most inviolable oath. However, I will be witness of your interview with the genie. All right, J-Math, good luck. Make sure you DM me, and uh, we'll uh, get together and figure out what game uh, you're getting on Steam. Got to know what's in your, uh, what you have already, so I know what to buy you. And congratulations on winning. <laughs> While the merchant and the old man who led the hind were talking, they saw another old man coming toward them, followed by two black dogs. When the newcomer was informed of the merchant's adventure, he declared his resolve to stay and see the issue. In a short time, they perceived a thick vapor, like a cloud of dust raised by a whirlwind, advancing toward them. When it had come up to them, it suddenly vanished, and the genie appeared. The genie, without saluting them, went to the merchant with a drawn scimitar, and taking him by the arm, said, Get thee up, that I may kill thee, as thou didst my son. The merchant and the two old men began to lament and fill the air with their cries. When the old man who led the hind saw the genie lay hold of the merchant, and about to kill him, he threw himself at the feet of the monster, and kissing them, said to him, Prince of Genie, I most humbly request you to suspend your anger and do me the favor to listen to the history of my life and of the hind you see. And if you think it more wonderful and surprising than the adventure of the merchant, I hope you will pardon the unfortunate man one half of his offense. The genie took some time to deliberate on this proposal, but answered at last, Well then, I agree. So now we're going to a Story within a story within a story. All the people trying to avoid terrible fates. <laughs> it's a very, very meta book. Whereupon the old man with the hind told his story. This hind, you see, is my wife, whom I married when she was twelve years old, and we lived together for twenty years without having any children. It's an excellent question, Panda. There's only one way to find out. My desire of having children induced me to adopt the son of a slave. My wife, being jealous, cherished a hatred for both the child and his mother, but concealed her aversion so well that I knew nothing of it till it was too late. While I was away on a long journey, she applied herself to magic, and by her enchantments she changed the child into a calf, and the mother into a cow, and gave them both into the charge of my farmer. <laughs> On my return, I inquired for the mother and child. She informed me that the slave was dead, and that as for my adopted son, she had not seen him in months. I regretted the death of the slave, but as my son had only disappeared, I was in hopes he would shortly return. However, eight months passed, and I had heard nothing of him. When the festival of the great Baram was to be celebrated, I sent to my farmer for one of the fattest cows to sacrifice. He accordingly sent me one, and I bound her. But as I was going to sacrifice her, she bellowed piteously, and I could perceive tears streaming from her eyes. This seemed to me very extraordinary, and finding myself moved with compassion, I could not find it in my heart to give her a blow, but ordered my farmer to get me another. <laughs> 
My wife, who was present, was enraged at my tenderness and resistance to an order which disappointed her malice. She upbraided me for not sacrificing the cow for the festival. Out of deference to my wife, I ordered the farmer, less compassionate than myself, to sacrifice her. But when he flayed her, he found her to be nothing except bones, though to us she seemed very fat. I ordered him to take her away and dispose of her in alms, or any way he pleased, but if he had a very fat calf, to bring it to me in her stead. He returned with a fat calf, which as soon as it beheld me, made so great an effort to come near me that he broke his cord, threw himself at my feet with his head against the ground, as if he meant to excite my compassion and implore me not to be so cruel as to take his life. <coughs> Sorry. I was more surprised and affected with this action than with the tears of the cow, and I told my wife that I would not sacrifice this calf, no matter what she said. The wicked woman had no regard for my wishes, but urged me until I yielded. I tied the poor creature, and taking up the fatal knife, was going to plunge it into the calf's throat. When turning his eyes, bathed with tears, in a languishing manner toward me, he affected me so much that I had not the strength to kill him. I let the knife fall, and told my wife positively that I would have another calf to sacrifice and pacified her a little by promising that I would sacrifice him against the Baram of the following year. I was not choking on air, I was choking on tea. Which, you know, isn't much better. The next morning my farmer desired to speak with me alone. He told me that his daughter, who had some skill in magic, desired to see me. When she was admitted, she informed me that while I was on my journey, my wife had changed the slave into a cow and the child into a calf. She could not restore the slave, who in the shape of a cow had been sacrificed, but she could give me my adopted son again, and would do so if she might have him for a husband, and also punish my wife as she deserved. When I had given my consent to these proposals, the damsel then took a vessel full of water, pronounced over it words that I did not understand, and throwing the water over the calf, he in an instant recovered his natural form. I immediately embraced him and told him how the damsel had freed him from his enchantment, and how I had promised her that he would be her husband. He joyfully consented, but before they married, she changed my wife into a hind, and this is she whom you see here. Since that time, my son has become a widower and gone to travel. It being now several years since I heard of him, I am come abroad to inquire after him, and not being willing to trust anybody with my wife till I should return home, I thought fit to take her everywhere with me. This is the history of myself and this hind. Is it not one of the most wonderful and surprising? I admit it is, said the genie, and on that account I forgive the merchant one half of his crime. <laughs> when the first old man had finished his story, the second who led the two black dogs, addressed the genie, and said, I am going to tell you what happened to me, and these two black dogs you see by me. But when I have done this, I hope you will pardon the merchant the other half of his offense. I will, replied the genie, provided your story surpass that of the hind. Then the second old man began in this manner. Great prince of genie, you must know that we are three brothers, the two black dogs and myself. Our father, when he died, left each of us one thousand sequins. With that sum, we all became merchants. My brothers resolved to travel and trade in foreign countries. At the end of a year, they returned in abject poverty, having an unfortunate enterprises, lost all. I welcomed them home, and having prospered, gave each of them a thousand sequins to start them again as merchants. After a while, they came to me to propose that I should join them in a trading voyage. I immediately declined. But after having resisted their solicitation five whole years, they importuned me so much that at last they overcame my resolution. When, however, the time arrived that we were to buy the goods necessary to the undertaking, I found that they had spent all and had nothing left of the thousand sequins I had given to each of them. I did not, on this account, upbraid them. 
On the contrary, my stock being now six thousand sequins, I gave each of them a thousand, and keeping as much for myself, I buried the other three thousand in a corner of my house. We purchased goods, and having embarked them on board a vessel, excuse me, which we freighted betwixt us, we put to sea with a favorable wind. After two months' sail, we arrived happily at a port, where we landed and had a very good market for our goods. I, especially, sold mine so well that I gained ten to one. When we were ready to embark on our return, I met on the seashore a lady, very handsome but poorly clad. She walked up to me gracefully, kissed my hand, and besought me with greatest earnestness imaginable to marry her. I made some difficulty before agreeing to this proposal. But she urged so many things to persuade me that I ought not to object to her on account of her poverty, and that I should have all the reason in the world to be satisfied with her conduct, that at last I yielded. I ordered proper apparel to be made for her, and after having married her, according to form, I took her on board and we set sail. I found that my wife possessed so many good qualities that my love for her every day increased. In the meantime, my two brothers, who had not managed their affairs as successfully as I had mine, envied my prosperity. They suffered their feelings to carry them so far that they conspired against my life. One night, when my wife and I were asleep, they threw us both into the sea. I had scarcely fallen into the water when she took me up and carried me to an island. When daylight appeared, my wife informed me that she was in reality a fairy who had presented herself to me in disguise to test my goodness. As I had dealt generously with her, said she, now she would deal generously with me, but that my brothers would have to pay for their treachery with their lives. I listened to this discourse with admiration. I thanked the fairy the best way I could for the great kindness she had done me. But as for my brothers, I begged her to pardon them. Whatever cause of resentment they might have given me, I was not cruel enough to desire their death. I then informed her what I had done for them, but this only increased her indignation, and she exclaimed that she must immediately pursue those ungrateful traitors and take speedy vengeance on them. I pacified her as best I could, and as soon as I had concluded, she transported me in a moment from the island to the roof of my own house. I descended opened up the doors and dug up the 3,000 sequins I had previously secreted. I went afterward to my shop, which I also opened, and was complimented by the merchants, my neighbors, upon my return. When I went back to my house, I perceived there two black dogs, which came up to me in a very submissive manner. I could not divine the meaning of this circumstance, which greatly astonished me. But the fairy, who immediately appeared, told me not to be surprised to see these dogs, that they were my brothers. I was troubled at this declaration, and asked her by what power they were so transformed. Then she told me that she had done it at the same time that she had sunk their ship. They were to remain in their present form for five years. Then telling me where I might find her after the five years had passed, she disappeared. The five years being now nearly expired, I am traveling in quest of her. This is my history, O Prince of Genie. Do you not think it is very extraordinary? I own it is, replied the genie, and on that account I remit the merchant of the other half of the crime which he has committed against me. With these words the genie rose and disappeared in a cloud of smoke, to the great delight of the merchant and the two old men. The merchant failed not to make due acknowledgment to his deliverers. They rejoiced to see him out of danger, and bidding him adieu, each of them proceeded on his way. The merchant returned to his wife and children, and passed the rest of his days with them in peace. The Story of the Fisherman and the Genie there once was an aged fisherman who was so poor that he could scarcely earn as much as would maintain himself, his wife, and three children. He went early every day to fish in the morning and imposed it as a law upon himself 
not to cast his nets above four times a day. That might be why he's so poor. He went one morning before the moon had set, and coming to the seaside, undressed himself. Three times did he cast his net, and each time he made a heavy haul. Yet, to his indescribable disappointment and despair, the first proved to be an ass. <laughs> nope, another story. The first proved to be an ass, the second a basket full of stones, and the third a mass of mud and shells. As daylight now began to appear, he said his prayers, for he was a good Mussulman, and commended himself and his needs to his creator. Having done this, he cast his nets the fourth time and drew them as formerly with great difficulty. But instead of fish, he found nothing in them but a vessel of yellow copper, having the impression of a seal upon its leaden cover. This turn of fortune rejoiced him. I will sell it, said he, to the smelter, and with the money, by a measure of corn. He examined the vessel on all sides, and shook it to see if its contents made any noise, but heard nothing. This circumstance, together with the impression of the seal upon the leaden cover, made him think it enclosed something precious. To satisfy himself, he took his knife and pried open the lid. He turned the mouth downward, but to his surprise, nothing came out. He placed it before him, and while he sat gazing at it attentively, there came forth a very thick smoke, which obliged him to ret retire two or three paces. The smoke ascended to the clouds, and extending itself along the sea and upon the shore, formed a great mist, which we may well imagine filled the fishermen with astonishment. When the smoke was all out of the vessel, it reformed and became a solid mass, which changed before his eyes into a genie twice as high as the greatest of giants. At the sight of such a monster, the fisherman would fain have fled, but was so frightened that he could not move. The genie regarded the fisherman with a fierce look and exclaimed in a terrible voice, Prepare to die, for I will surely kill thee. By the way, the genies, not at all like the genie in the Disney movie. Ah, replied the fisherman, why would you kill me? Did I ju not just now set you at liberty? And have you already forgotten my kindness? Yes, I remember it, said the genie, but that shall not save thy life. I have only one favor to grant thee. And what is that? asked the fisherman. It is, answered the genie, to give thee thy choice in what manner thou wouldst have me put thee to death. But wherein have I offended you? demanded the fisherman. Is that your reward for the service I have rendered you? <laughs> I cannot treat thee otherwise, said the genie, and that thou mayest know the reason. Hearken to my story. I am one of those rebellious spirits that oppose the will of heaven. Solomon, the son of David, commanded me to acknowledge his power and to submit to his commands. I refused, and told him I would rather expose myself to his resentment than swear fealty as he required. To punish me, he shut me up in this copper vessel, and that I might not break my prison, he himself stamped upon this leaden cover, his seal, with the great name of God engraved upon it. He then gave the vessel to a genie, with orders to throw me into the sea. During the first hundred years of my imprisonment, I swore that if anyone should deliver me before the expiration of that period, I would make him rich. During the second, I made an oath that I would open all the treasures of the earth to anyone that might set me at liberty. In the third, I promised to make my deliverer a potent monarch, to be always near him in spirit, and to grant him every day three requests of whatsoever nature they might be. At last, being angry to find myself a prisoner so long, I swore that if anyone should deliver me, I would kill him without mercy and grant him no other favor than to choose the manner of his death. And therefore, since thou hast delivered me today, I give thee that choice. The fisherman was extremely grieved, not so much for himself as on account of his three children 
and bewailed the misery to which they must be reduced by his death. He endeavored to appease the genie and said, Alas, be pleased to take pity on me in consideration of the service I have done you. I have told thee already, replied the genie. It is for that very reason I must kill thee. Do not lose time. All thy reasoning shall not divert me from my purpose. Make haste, and tell me what manner of death thou preferrest. Necessity is the mother of invention. The fisherman, therefore, bethought, bethought himself of a stratagem. Since I must die, then, he said he to the genie, I submit to the will of heaven. But before I choose the manner of my death, I conjure you by the great name which was engraved upon the seal of the prophet Solomon, the son of David, to answer me truly the question I am going to ask you. The genie, finding himself obliged to make a positive answer by this adjuration, trembled. Then he replied to the fisherman, Ask what thou wilt, but make haste. I wish to know, asked the fisherman, if you were actually in this vessel. Dare you swear it by the name of the great God? Yes, replied the genie, I do swear by that great name that I was. In good faith, answered the fisherman, I cannot believe you. The vessel is not capable of holding one of your stature. And how is it possible that your whole body could lie in it? Is it possible, replied the genie, that thou dost not believe me after the solemn oath I have taken? Truly not I, said the fisherman, nor will I believe you, unless you go into the vessel again. Thereupon the body of the genie dissolved and changed itself to smoke, extending as before upon the seashore. And at last, being collected, it began to re-enter the vessel, which it continued to do till no part remained outside. Immediately the fisherman took the cover of lead and speedily replaced it on the vessel. Genie, cried he, now it is your turn to beg my favor, but I shall throw you into the sea whence I took you. Then I will build a house upon the shore, where I will reside and give notice to all fishermen who come to throw in their nets, to beware of such a wicked genie as you are, who has made an oath to kill the person who sets you at liberty. The genie began to plead with the fisherman. Open the vessel, said he. Give me my liberty, and I promise to satisfy thee to thine own content. You are a traitor, replied the fisherman. I should deserve to lose my life if I were such a fool as to trust you. You would not fail to treat me in the same manner as a certain Grecian king treated the physician Dubon. It is a story I have a mind to tell you. Therefore, listen to it. Take a quick break there. As we go one story into the next... But yeah, it's, uh, genies are a little bit different than uh, Disney would have you see them. Not something to trust at all. Not so much. Not so much at all. <sighs> uh, you guys want to watch some magic? Okay. My throat's a little scratchy. Apparently I get out of practice um, <laughs> reading out loud pretty quick. All right. Well, let me ditch the hoodie and then we'll switch over to magic.
All right, let's see. Go ahead and reconnect. Oh, I had a really good match the other day. I, uh, actually had um, gotten knocked down to like negative two hit points and I managed to come back from that and win pretty thoroughly <laughs> I got a dollar I got a dollar I got a dollar hey 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 I think I'm worth more than a dollar I'd like to think I have some value And switch to the gaming screen. <sighs> there we go. And go to stream manager. <laughs> Edit stream info. You know, Arabian Nights was actually uh, one of the early sets of magic. <laughs> like Magic the Gathering. Pretty sure I still have a um, bunch of cards from it. Uh, if I have, it was a long time ago. Apparently we lost a couple of people for watching Magic. Ticket, not everybody was a Magic fan. That's all right, though. Don't have to be. Ooh, we got something new in the store. What do we got? Anything good? Yeah, sure. We'll pick up a pack for 500. Let's see what we get. <laughs> He-Man Woman Haters Club? I have no idea what you're talking about. Don't dude me. <laughs> Check this one out. The Flaxen Intruder with a bloody sword and a bear trap and three bear heads up on the wall. Is clearly Goldilocks. <laughs> Ooh, I was actually thinking about using a uh, a wild card to get this one. It's good for cycling your creatures. All right, let's play a match. I tweaked my deck a bit. I was trying really hard to make the uh, shrines work, but even the games I was winning, I wasn't usually getting all the shrines out. The shrines were kind of an aid to the victory, but they weren't the mechanic for it. So I peeled them out, and um, this is the deck I ended up with. It's kind of like the Vito deck, but... Vito is also almost secondary to this. So let's see how it plays out. I wonder if this is supposed to be a Skyrim reference.
I heard a great um, bit of Skyrim trivia the other day. So, uh, why did the Dragonborn go to High Hrothgar? Anybody? To see what all the foos was about. Uh, it's terrible. It's Fusro Dawes, the uh, first like shout he learns, and he learns it on High Hrothgar. Don't crickets me. It was funny. I thought it was funny. Apparently nobody else likes my jokes. Okay, I see how it is. His lands are kind of pretty though. Oh, ow, ow, it's stingy. He's beating me up. Well, that giant's got to go. And... Let's try. Let's get that guy out. <laughs> okay. tell you the people tend to fall into one of two categories with the revenge of ravens either they notice it and they get overly intimidated about it and then don't want to attack at all even when it's a good idea or they don't notice it and end up like killing themselves with it So now, every creature that attacks is going to do two damage to him and give me two life. Which is like the perfect counter for the Scoot Swarm decks. As the way they win is by having just overwhelming numbers. Alright, so let's go Fortell. And let's get the lantern out. Love me this lantern. Lantern is awesome. <laughs> no attacks needed. you gonna do dude <laughs> I only love it when it is being used against you honestly this deck usually doesn't rely on attacking so it doesn't so much matter if Revenge of Ravens is being used against me or not or did you mean the lantern 
Because you're right, I don't like it when the lantern's used against me. <laughs> no, I don't like getting lantern. But I do like me using the lantern. It's a lot of fun. Hmm. It's giving up his scoot swarm. Interesting. Pull the king. He's always useful. It it is a bit, although if he got it mutated, it could be somewhat useful. Quit. Lame. Oh well. <laughs> All right, let's see how high we can climb. What do you guys think? We made it to diamond last month. It probably was. It's one thing that I have issues with this in, in this game is I tend to make my decks overly large because I want versatility and I don't want to be able to be shut down that way where, you know, they interrupt one mechanic and suddenly the deck is pointless. I like having a multitude of synergies able to win, but that are like compatible with each other, right? I probably should have played Ravens. Oh well. <laughs> like this card is great with the mask wood because then every spell I've got is an angel spell and suddenly things get really cheap really fast. Ooh, it's a new card. Hmm. And the Scry 3 is nice, but kind of a limited impact for that uh, draw 3. Ooh, this is a fun one. I just kind of stuck in. Gives me an extra turn. I'll hang on to that. So there's a nice little synergy here between Vito, the Angel, and Revenge of Ravens. So he attacks, and as we talked about in the last game, you get one damage to him, one life to me. But because of the angel, it becomes two life to me. And then with Vito, that two life becomes two damage to him, so it becomes three damage to him, two life to me. 
for each creature that attacks. <laughs> and of course he copied my stuff. That's all right though. I will forgive him. Hey, yeah, Gecko. Wow, he's putting a lot of cards out. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. Let's go ahead and foretell that. Although I won't be able to cast it till I get some of my uh, any color mana cards. No attacks. Do you want to play some gecko? <laughs> okay. Jump on and send me a challenge after this match and we'll play around. Anybody else want to play one? plus up every creature on the board thing. <laughs> Ew. That wasn't nice. That was super nasty. Oh, what a bastard. <laughs> ah, now I gotta discard cards. Shit. Alright. We'll discard the midnight clock. Yeah, that was super nasty. Grossness. All right, need some blockers. Let's get a veto out. Angel. Man, that was really painful. So the clock uh, picks up counters every upkeep. Oh, that wasn't nice. Sacrificing Vito, but you can sacrifice Vito or die. Okay. 
you out and order. Celebrant. Eerie, and we will foretell. Here should light off. Okay, it's four more life. All right, I might survive this. Maybe. It was looking grim for a minute there. All right, let's see. We've got five, six, seven. So that'll give us three angels. Why are you all by yourself, fella? I'll join you in the Discord. There you go. I'm in Discord with you now. Hello. How is the Vela? Oh my god, and it's a gecko too. All the cool people in the Discord. Aw, oh, assume magic. All right, I'm going to hang on to this till next turn so that I can duplicate it. With this turn, I will duplicate the Evolving Wilds. It's a cute little trick with Lithoform so you can actually get two lands out of that or the Fabled ones. Okay, so he's got one, two, three, four, five flyers. Five attackers. So don't go out in the cold. Well, then go out in the cold. <laughs> Sorry, I know that's not super helpful. Dude, if you uh, don't block those griffins. Neg 42 is pretty chilly. And that's game. Ready, Gecko? 
酷。Challenged by the gecko. You're not looking at my stream, are you, Gecko? You mute the tab. <laughs> Can't have you cheaty cheatering. Kick, you kick my butt too easily. That's a cute uh, sleeve from the Extra Life Charity stream, yeah? It's adorable. Wait. So tell me about this deck you made, Gecko. It looks suspiciously familiar. Oh god, you made a veto deck. <sighs> this is why you shouldn't inspire your friends. She's gonna turn my tactics against me. Hmm. <laughs> it's fine. You're a bit of a dork, but it's fine. Eh, for me, it's a compliment. <laughs> for a second, I was like, why is magic getting so intense? And then I realized it's just Alex's stream in the background. Hmm. I don't like Vito. So I think Vito got to go. Sound good to you? I don't like the lantern either. Man. How is this payback? I never won. <laughs> If I had been winning against you, I could understand how it was payback, but I didn't win. I got my butt kicked repeatedly. Hmm. I don't like that card. I don't like that card. What? I told you I don't like that card. Did you think I was kidding? Can't be having that shit here. Yes, I do have a veto.
No, you don't veto veto. I didn't veto two vetoes. I killed one veto. I killed him dead. Oh my god, stop lanterning me. It hurts. It hurts me, my precious. All the super boops. How you like them boops? No, that was my veto. How dare you? I loved him. He was my precious. But I don't like you having a veto. Your avocados changed your plan? Don't your avocado change your plan? Okay. Hey, I like that card though. It's a good card. But I like my graveyard. Why do you get rid of my graveyard? Vela Gecko's picking on me. Gecko's picking on me, Vela. It's not nice. Stop it. That wasn't nice, Gecko. Good game, though.
Yeah, go again. Gecko. I'll take that as a yes. Can you hear me, Gecko? Can you hear me, Gecko? Okay. Okay. Gecko just wouldn't say anything back. So, you know, I wasn't sure. Why is it going burr? Is it that cold? I'm glad you can hear me, Sparky. I wasn't sure. Oh, I think I might make this my last game, though. Vela just told me it's obviously bedtime. I love it. I love it so much. Oh. Oh. You gotta say boop the nose. I don't do what things? Boop the snoot? She booped my snoot. I poop when I boop. I say the boops. I say all the boops. Good lord, how many maze minds do you have? <sighs> One, two, twenty. How have I polluted you? I I see nothing wrong with this. That seems like an excellent outcome. Why are you questioning this? Got me all Twitter painted, Gecko. I don't know what to do. <laughs> what was that noise? <laughs> I don't think I did anything that merited that noise. Excuse me. Hopefully that didn't come through stream. Relaxing mouth noises, damn it. <laughs> no, so I had to do it for her. Bye, Vito. Hey, what? What? No, you didn't. No veto for you. You don't need a veto.
He's the unneedo veto. <laughs> yes, definitely ASMR. For sure. A little stuffy, sorry. Oh, you didn't. You did, didn't you? Gecko. Did you do the thing I think you did? That's not nice, Gecko. That's not nice at all. Well, I'm in trouble if she gets seven land. Like, big trouble. Don't like it. Okay. How you like that? That's game, isn't it? Gecko. Did you just win? You've got the mana to cast it. Three black mana and four others. You've got Underworld Dreams up. You get to search your library for the card. Ready to see Gecko do something dirty, Vela? Where's the dirty? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Ah! Oh. Did when you cast that spell to go searching? Did you think you had? Uh, it's this card that makes you lose half your hit points rounded down and then draw half your library. And when you combo it with this Underworld Dreams, which does a point of damage for every card you draw, it's an insta-win. And I thought she'd just gotten it. But apparently she's a super dork.
I found a fun card. Just wanted to make suicide griffins. the veto off all the enchantments. Why'd you do that with the uh, veto? I'm confused. That was a lot of owies there, Gecko. What, you didn't like that? Do you really not have that card?
Me? Why? I like my life game. Hmm. It's going to be like that, is it? I don't think I like that. and throw that one out. And let's see if this actually works. <laughs> one or two. Right. If I did this right, I should have another turn. You don't like that? I thought that was pretty good. What do you think? Did you like that? it was pretty good play three turns in a row get rid of your king and your veto gain a whole bunch of life hey that's not nice you're gonna make me do a thing now i didn't want to do a thing to you but i'm gonna have to do a thing to you Six, seven, eight, thirteen. So that's six. That's the thing. Do you like that thing? No. Well, it's your fault. You made me do the thing. <laughs> Why you gotta do that? It was, wasn't it? You should be. 
Okay, well, fine. There's other things we can do. We can get that out. And then we could put that out. And then we could put this out. And then while we're at it, we could put this out. <laughs> That's not going to do much at this point. Partly because this. And then I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. And here, we'll put a clock to count down. The snoot. <laughs> Are you searching for another board clear? Go for it. Oops. You do? Is it non do? Oh, just a shadow of the sky. Okay. <laughs> you would have had to sacrifice so many creatures. <laughs> Isn't it great? Oh, I think it's great. All right, well, let's get that out. And we'll duplicate it. Alex is having a good time. Oh, he's giggling and laughing along. Maybe a little bit. Casting <laughs> tight. Here, I'll get rid of a board clear since I don't need it. You can have my 1-1 one, one as well. You'd have to sacrifice three creatures each time that happened, though. If you had any. I mean... Here, I'll get rid of a land, too. How about that? Did you like that? Hmm. Well, I suppose that lantern should go. And then we'll duplicate that. And I don't know. I guess we'll get rid of one of those underworld dreams. They're being kind of annoying. That'll do. Ah, uh, you might sometimes be an ass, but I don't think you're a donkey. Play that. And we'll attack. And we'll just boop you down one point at a time. Nope. 
No, you don't think so? I think so. Yeah, we'll get rid of those. So you're going to block it? Okay. <laughs> Isn't it great? You kill any of my creatures and you'd have to... I am giggling. I. It is very well warranted here. I have earned these giggles. that guy get rid of a Daxos because you don't really need him a little bit yeah maybe a touch What's wrong, Gekka? Poop the snoot. All the griffin ears. Oh, I'm not. I'm just going to end it. See all the uh, card draw and life triggers? <laughs> it's a nice deck, isn't it? Which one? Which one? Oh, uh, is... yes. It's got the weird, like, mouth on the eyeballs looking thing. It's creepy looking. All right. 
If you'd had that card, I would have been dead. All right, you go do your adulting. I shall do my sleeping because it's obviously bedtime. And since the three people that are still in here are Artie and Alex's stream anyway, I'm not going to bother with a raid. See it. <laughs>